Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our gathering together at the feet of the Lord even this morning. We are praying, O Lord, that as you speak to our hearts, our hearts will respond in faith, in obedience, with willingness to do your will in Jesus' name. Reveal more of yourself unto us and help us to give more of ourselves unto you. In Jesus' name, we pray. This morning, I'm talking to you on power for Christian living. Power for Christian living. Living the Christian life as outlined in the Word of God is of great, great importance. Empty profession and testimonies without foundation will not suffice on the day of reckoning. Yet, the Christian standard as revealed in the Word of God is so high that none of us can measure up to it in his own strength. The question then is this, how can we live up to the standard that God has set that he demands in his holy word. And I only one answer. Only by the power we have through Christ, through God's word, and through the Holy Ghost, can we live the life of the real Christian. We're told in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. To live the Christian life, it is not by your own strength or your own power. It is not by your own might, or your own ability. It is by the Spirit of the Lord Himself. We're going to look at three points as we look at the power that enables us to live the standard Christian life. One, Christ, our Savior and strength. Two, God's Word, our sword and standard. Three, the Holy Spirit, our supporter and sustainer. Number one, Christ, our Savior and strength. We're told in John chapter 15, reading from verse 5. John 15 verse 5, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. There is no one, whatever the willpower, whatever the strong determination, that will pick up the Bible and read the Bible and be able to justify himself in the sight of the Lord. Because the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Without any exception, there is no human being on the face of the earth. By his own strength, without knowing Christ, without being born again, who can boast of living according to the standard of the word of God? And here we are told, without Christ, we can do nothing. Paul the Apostle, before he was born again, was a strong-willed man. He was a person that was so determined. Whatever he wanted to do, he boasted that he will do it. He feared no one. And you would have felt that a person like that, a Pharisee, a person that was so strict in the obedience to the law of the Old Testament, you would have thought a person like that lived a victorious life over every form of sin. That in his own strength, he could have pulled up himself by his bootstraps. But he later testified he couldn't do it. In Philippians chapter 3, 
Philippians chapter 3 from verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man thinketh that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am all. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of the of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, and touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now talking about the time before he was born again, he said he minutely looked at the law of the Old Testament, and he did his best. And if men were to give him a score, a mark, they would have given him a pass mark. And he said, looking at the law of the Old Testament, I judged myself blameless. Then the light of the gospel came in. And he said, I had not known sin, but by the revelation of the word of God. When the full light comes to you, when the real light of the gospel comes across your pathway, you will know the best you have ever done is still sinful in the sight of God. In Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, from verse 7, What shall I say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lost, except the Lord had said, Thou shalt not covet, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Looking at it in verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that I do not. But what I hate, that I do. That is the testimony of a strong-willed man, an enlightened man, a seriously cultured man, a person that felt concerning the righteousness of the law, that he had been blameless when the real light, the true light came to him, he saw his wretchedness, and he cried out in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Something is very clear. Without Christ, we can do nothing. You cannot save yourself. You cannot put yourself. You cannot purify yourself. You cannot create or make a ladder of your own making and then climb through that ladder and get to heaven. You cannot stretch a bridge across the chasm, across the great gulf between you and God and then build a bridge that will make you cross over. Neither can you spin over. Neither can you try to think out a kind of religion and bypass Christ and still be able to get to God. Without Christ, we can do nothing. But when you realize that you are a sinner and you come to the Lord, realizing that this, behold, the lamp of God who taketh away the sin of the world, and you call upon the Lord, and you tell Him to forgive you and to change your life, immediately you have a change of life. By the grace of God, He forgives you. By the grace of God, He changes your life. Everything becomes new in your life by the power of the cross in your life. In Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Before he comes into Christ, he remains the old creature. He may try to determine, he may try to make resolutions, he may try to behave like a gentleman, he may try to talk in a nice way, he may try openly, superficially to live a life that is, um, that is above sin. But in the real sense of it, before a man comes into Christ, he's going to remain the old creature. And the old man is going to be controlling him. And Satan, the God of this world, is going to be ruling him, overruling every action of his life. But when he comes into Christ, therefore, if any man be in Christ, is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And there is only one way all things can become new. It is only by the power of him that says, Behold, I make all things new. Only by him that God has raised up, through which he says, Think not of the old things, because there will be springs in the desert, and through him he will make all things new in your life. Because as a natural human being, you do not have the strength, you do not have the grace and the power to live a life that will be pleasing unto God. We are told in Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 6, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, here Paul the Apostle tells us there was a time we were without strength. He told the Roman believers, he said, there was a time that all of you, together with himself, the writer of the epistle, we were without strength. You see, before you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you do not have any strength to live the righteous life. And if you will not give your life to the Lord and you think you are going to live a righteous life, and eventually you will make heaven it's impossible that way. When we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. But then we're told in Romans chapter 8 from verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That's the answer. That's the answer. Come out of yourself and come into Christ Stop leaning on your artificial walking stick, thinking that you'll be able to walk uprightly. Lean upon the Lord. Stop looking inward, thinking there is some strength in you, inner power in you, that will make you to be able to live an heavenly, holy life. Start looking outward, looking to the cross of Jesus Christ, and looking to him that said, Look unto me, all ye the ends of the earth, and be ye saved. Therefore there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh what the law could not do you see there are people that will write the Ten Commandments on a particular poster. And they put that ten, they put the poster of Ten Commandments in their sitting room. They read it every day. They think through it every day. And yet they are not born again. And even though you have all those commandments there on the wall, you cannot keep to the word. Because it says what the law could not do. What the reading of the law. Looking at the law on the wall every time. And making sure that you are reading it and interpreting it every time. Making sure that you are checking your life and gauging your life by those commandments every time. And yet you find out that when you come back at night, you have already violated the law of God. Why? Because of the weakness of the human flesh. Because of the weakness of the human nature. Because of the weakness of the strongest of all men. But then it says, God sending his own son. In the likeness of sinful flesh. What that means is that he was born of virgin Mary. And he put on our flesh. And yet he condemned sin in the flesh. He lived without sin. Verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. That's why God sent His only begotten Son, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. What's the answer? Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Welcome Him in as the great victor over sin 
and over Satan. Welcome him in as the one who has overcome all the temptations that may ever come to you now. And then as he, as he enters into you, when temptation comes, it will give you inner spiritual ability to be able to overcome. What's the power for living the Christian life? Christ, our Savior and strength. In Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, from verse 17, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. There are so many temptations that come to men and women, boys and girls in this world that it will be literally impossible, practically impossible for you on your own to be able to overcome that Satan with his temptation. They are not a match for any human being, but it is as you lean on Christ, as you depend upon Christ, as you get in His grace into your life. He is able to succor, to support, to strengthen, and to lift up the people that have their confidence and they put their trust in Him. Hebrews chapter 4, from verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. If you need a helper, if you need a sustainer, if you need an inner strength, you will apply and appeal to him who had been tempted like we are, and yet without sin. He had gone through this road before. He had experienced all these harassments and temptations before. He had put on even the flesh before, and yet from the very day he came into this world until the day he left this world in thought, in imagination, in decision, in will, in words of his mouth, in the use of his tongue, in the use of any part of his body, he never lived, he never committed a sin. Tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. If he lived a righteous life, a pure life, a perfect life, a holy life, then he knows how to help us. If we depend upon him, if we give our lives unto him to start with, then he makes us to be able to overcome. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. That's why we need to uh, have identification with the Lord and say what Paul the Apostle said in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. If you will understand the presence of Christ within you, and you always look to him who lives within you, for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you always depend upon him when temptation comes. You always depend upon him when the harassments of the devil will come to you. And you always depend upon him when there is a pull, an enticement, an invitation from all the things out there in the world uh, to live a life that is evil, to say what is wrong, to decide what is wrong, to imagine what is wrong, to think what is wrong, and to turn away from the holy way of the Lord. If you will look up to the Lord, he will always support you and strengthen you. And you will live by the grace and the power of him who has already overcome the devil. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, 
I live by the I not live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God, who loved me and he gave himself for me. And he gave himself to me as well. Now, in number two, what else do we have that will help you and help me to live the real Christian life? As I told you, the standard is so high and holy that you on your own, myself on my own, I cannot live that life. You cannot live that life except by the power of the Lord. And the number one point, and you must be saved before any other sin will work in your life. Christ living on the inside of you, Christ within you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But then number two, God's word, our sword and standard. God's word, our sword and standard. Let's look at Psalm, uh, Psalm 119, verse 2. Psalm 119, verse 2. Blessed are they. That keep his testimonies and, and the, that seek him with their whole heart. You see, after you have known the Lord, you begin, you continue to seek the Lord with all your heart. You don't look back. You don't pull back. You don't relax. You don't say, now I've got saved and there's nothing else for me to seek. You're still seeking the face of the Lord with all your heart. Now verse 9. Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed, thereto, according to thy word. By taking heed, thereto, according to thy word. Verse 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. To start with, how am I going to know the standard of God's requirement without reading the word of God? How am I going to judge the thoughts that are coming to my heart, whether it is acceptable or not, without knowing the standard of the Word of God? How am I going to know the requirement of the Lord for my life, without reading through the Word of God and knowing the standard that the Lord Himself expects of a believer? How am I going to know that I'm clean enough for heaven, holy enough for heaven, acceptable in the sight of God, without looking at the word of God, the standard that he himself has said. Therefore, we need to understand that this is the standard. Let's look at that to start with, before we look at the very fact that the word of God is a sword as well. In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. To the law. And to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. We are to have a standard. You see, if a manufacturer is manufacturing something, he has to have a model. And he has to be able to keep that, to have that model, to know that he's manufacturing according to model, according to standard. If a builder is building a house, he ought to have a, the drawing from the architect, the design. Then he will know he has a standard. If a student is studying, he has to have the model. He has to have the, the syllabus and also the questions that will be asked at the end of the course. He has to have an idea of the kind of question. Then he will know that he is working and preparing according to the standard. You see, without having a model, without having a standard, you will think that already you are living right. Therefore, go back to the word of God, because this is the standard of the word, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, if they give you a standard, a principle lower than this word, if they give you something that is not up to the level, up to the height, and up to the holiness demanded by this word, you know it is because there is no light in them. In Jeremiah chapter 23, Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 22. But if they had stood in my counsel, and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way, and from the evil of their doings. Here the Lord said, all, all we preachers need to do is just to stand in the counsel 
of the Lord. That's what we need to do. We do not, to, we do not need to preach anything outside this book. This is the standard. We cannot add to it. We cannot take away from it. We cannot modify it. Bring the whole world before the whole congregation of the people of God. And you have done in all. And it's Jesus, the word of God here says, If they had stood in my counsel, then they would have caused my people to hear my words. And hearing the word of God, that will be enough. That will be the standard. And let us look at it from verse 25. I have heard what the prophet said, that prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. This is, you know, the problem with many people. Instead of looking at the word of God as the standard, they bring their dreams as their own, as the standard of living. They'll say, well, I had a dream like this, and in my dream, God has told me that this one is permitted, this one is permitted, that one is permitted. The word of God is the standard. Other people will say, we've got a new revelation. And in that new revelation, we have been assured, this is not bad, this is not bad, this is not bad. That's not the standard. The word of God is the standard. Other people will say, from what I think, from what I feel, from the way I look at it, from my own perspective, in my own opinion, I think this is the way we ought to go. This is not bad. That is not bad. It's not what you think. It's not your opinion on the, at the great white throne judgment of God, on the judgment day. God is not going to ask you, were you able to live up to the standard of your own personal opinion? Were you able to live up to the height of your own imagination? Those decisions you made and you felt this is the best way, were you able to fulfill what you thought was the best way? It's going to bring the word to you. The word I speak unto you, Jesus said, will judge you on that day. It's not your dream. It is not your new revelation. It is not your opinion. It is not your ideology. It is not your philosophy either. It is not what people are thinking or saying. It is the word of God that is the standard. Let's look at this verse 20, at, at it now from verse 26. How long? Shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, of their own thought, of their own imagination, of their own, um, of their own ideas and ideologies which thing to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. The prophet that has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is chaff to the wheat, says the Lord. God says, when you bring all the best dreams of the world together, when you bring all the best and the greatest of your dreams together, there will be chaff that will be burnt and blown away by the wind. But when you look at the word of God, the word of God will be what feeds the soul and the heart and the spirit of man. It is the wheat. What is the chaff to the wheat, says the Lord. It's not my word like as a fire, says the Lord. And like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces, therefore behold, I am against the prophet, says the Lord, that steal my words. Everyone from his neighbor. If you steal the word of God away from your neighbors, if you steal the word of God away from your wife, and you always tell your wife, you know, I, I had a dream. And at the end of the whole thing, you are trying to influence your wife in the line of your dream to forget the word of God. You are living in sin. If you say, you see, I have an idea. All those things we are hearing, they are preaching. I also have an idea. I have my opinion. And, and I think this my opinion. You know, it looks reasonable. Let me tell you. You tell your wife, or you tell your husband, or you tell your children, or you tell any other person, 
and you steal the word of God away, the standard of the word of God away from your neighbor, from your wife, from your husband, because of your dream, because of your imagination, you are doing harm. You are doing great, great harm. And it says, I am against the prophets that says, says the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Here is the standard of the word of God. And it is to this standard we are to keep. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, reading it from verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you to into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, unto another doctrine, unto another preaching, unto another kind of exhortation. You see, Paul the Apostle had given all these people in the region of Galatia, he had given them the real word of God. That was the standard. And then some other people came in and they said, in our own opinion. And he said, according to the revelation we have, and he said, according to the understanding and enlightenment we have received, and he said, according to another kind of exhortation which we want to give you now, and they began to change the word of God. They began to turn the Galatian Christians away from the real and the full and the standard gospel of the Lord. And Paul the Apostle said, I marvel, I'm so surprised, and I'm even shocked that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you with their dreams. But there be some that trouble you with their revelations. But there be some that trouble you with their opinions. But there be some that trouble you with their exhortation. And it says, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. Then he said, and these are strong words, strong words. Verse 8, but though we or an angel from heaven. And that's what some people will say. They saw an angel in their dream. An angel revealed this unto them. If any angel came to you to change the standard of the word of God, you know that that angel is from the pit of hell. It says, if there is an angel, even from heaven, now look at this, you have to know the truth to be strong, and to be so, and to be so bold to be able to say this, that if an angel were to come, not just from hell, not just from the air, if he were to come from heaven and preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man, whatever his title, he calls himself apostle, he calls himself prophet, she calls herself prophetess, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. You see, the standard is here. That's the word of God. And as you keep to that standard, then you will be able to live by the word of the Lord. That's why he tells us, look at this. In Second John, Second Epistle of John, reading from verse 9. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, has not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both God and the Son. When a preacher comes to you, find out. You see, abiding in the doctrine of Christ, before you listen to a preacher, you know, because there are a lot of people that can talk, sugar-coated mouth, oh, they can talk. Logically, they can talk convincingly they can talk and they can you know drive you this way drill you that way push you that way pull you that way and by the time they talk to you you'll be shaking your head and or you might even be crying you might even be praying very serious prayer but before you listen to them find out are they abiding in the doctrine of christ are they born again because being born again is the doctrine of christ are they walking in the narrow path or are they walking in the broad way? Find out. Are they talkatives? Because Jesus, the doctrine of Christ is, you know what tells us? That every idle word shall be judged on that day. 
Are there people that have the love of God in their hearts? Because it's not just quoting the word of God. They must show that they really have the love of God in their hearts. Do they love the brethren? Do they love other children of God? Are they the, or do they say they, they are the only people? The only people. They condemn every other person in the church. They condemn every other fellow around. Now you, you find out if they are really children of God. If they are abiding in the doctrine of Christ. Are they sanctified? Without spot? Without wrinkle? Without blemish? You find out. Do they have one wife? Or do they keep one at home? And they have concubines outside? Girlfriends outside? You check up. Before you listen to a person, find out, does he remain and abide in the doctrine of Christ? Or has he divorced his wife? And he has not married another one? And he's still preaching the Bible and preaching something that he calls the gospel? You find out, does he believe that rapture will take place? That Jesus Christ will come? And the church of the living God will be taken away? Does he believe that? Does he believe that the great uh, tribulation will definitely come? After the rapture, according to the revelation and the truth of the word of God, does he believe that Jesus Christ will reign? That he will be Lord of Lords and King of Kings? He will set up the millennial reign. Does he believe eventually all the children of God? If anybody is going to get to heaven without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. You find out, you check up, if they are keeping to the standard of the word of God, it is only when they are abiding in the totality, the entirety, the fullness of the doctrine of Christ, then we can listen to them. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speech. Before you can listen to anybody, and before you can follow anyone, then you must find out and check up whether they are abiding in the doctrine of Christ. If anyone comes to you and he does not bring this doctrine, you see what is called this doctrine here is the fullness and the totality and the entirety of everything that Jesus stood for is the total revelation that came from God revealed through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is in a bundle together and it is put as this doctrine. Which means, check up the whole bundle. If there should be 20 things in that bundle and two things are missing there, don't listen to him. This doctrine, it's in a whole bundle. And it's everything together. It is not just that I preach 7 out of 20. Or I, or I will preach a 13 out of 20. Or I am only preaching 15 out of 20. This doctrine, the fullness of the teaching of the gospel. If any man comes to you and he does not bring this doctrine, not that one, that other people are preaching this one. That's what the apostle said. He said, receive him not into your house. Don't even give him a chair to sit down. Don't even allow him to pour in all his dream, all his imagination, all his thoughts, all his uh, exhortation, all his principle on you. Don't let him say, let me explain to you why I don't believe sanctification. You don't believe it, don't even talk. Let me explain to you why I don't believe in being baptized in the Holy Ghost. Don't even let him talk. Let, let me explain to you why I don't agree with this thing they call one man, one wife, and why I believe it differently. Don't allow him to talk. He says, let me explain to you. You see, you will understand me when I explain to you. Let me explain to you why I believe that you don't have to be holy before you get to heaven. Don't even listen to him. If he tells you he doesn't believe the word of God, and he says, but I can, I can explain to you. And you will see that I am right. It says, look at it in verse 10 again. If there come any, no matter his title, no matter his experience, no matter his ability, no matter what he presents to know, no matter where he's coming from, no matter where he has gone to school, if any come unto you, and then he does not bring this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. What if you encourage him? What if you bid him God's speed? What if you say, well, you know, uh, my, my church is deeper life, therefore I cannot join you, but I'll be, I'll be sending something to you to know I am morally with you. I'm supporting you. In spirit I am with you, but I'm not with you in body. What will happen to you? 
Look at it in verse 11. For he that beateth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Then you'll be a sinner. Then you'll not be a real child of God. The standard is the word of God. Now, we've got the standard, we've got the word of God. How do we live according to this standard, according to the word of God? Now we look at the other part of the word of God, which makes the word of God like the sword of the Spirit. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You see, when temptation comes, when the devil comes, you pull out the sword. That's how we wrestle against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in high places, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You throw out the word of God. That's exactly how Jesus did it. When temptation came in Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 3, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. You see, the devil may come to you, and he will want you to use your power selfishly in the wrong way. He may want you to use your ability selfishly in the wrong way. He may want you to use your talent selfishly in the wrong way. You have that talent, you have that ability, you have that gift, and he wants you to use that gift selfishly so that maybe you'll have bread, maybe you'll have money, maybe you'll have this, maybe you'll have that. And he wants you to forsake the path that the Lord has made for you. And he says, look at this ability you have, look at this gift you have, now these are things you can do. Now Jesus had the power. He had the ability. What the devil wanted is that he will use, that he should use his ability in the wrong way, young man. Now the devil may say, you have that part of your body, that part of your body. You see it this way. After all, it belongs to you. It's telling you to use parts of your body in the wrong way. It's telling you to do something that will eventually bring condemnation and sin and evil upon you. Now, those who do not know the word of God, they will say, "Eh, why did God create me and give me this if I'm not to use it the way I like? You see, Jesus had the power. And the devil came with this influence and he said, it belongs to you. And the ability and the gift and the power, you can use it whichever way you like. But Jesus drew out the sword, the word of God, and he drove back the devil. Verse Paul, and he answered and said, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him into, an, into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest thou at any time dash thy foot against a stone. In the first temptation, he wanted him to use his gift, his talent, his ability, his power, his anointing, in the wrong way, selfishly. In this place now, he wanted him to use the promise of the Lord in the erroneous manner. You see, the devil may come and he brings temptation. He says, look at the promise of God. Look at the promise of God. Look at the promise of God. You see it selfishly. You see it and be proud about it. And let the people know that you are the very son of God. You see, if you, are want, if you are wanting to attract attention to yourself unduly, if you are wanting to do something that they will know this is who I am, they will know this is who I am. And then you are also saying, of course, I also depend upon the promise of God. God said, He will raise me up, He will exalt me, He will magnify me, He will do this and do that. And therefore now, you take that promise And in a selfish way, you try to use it in a wrong way. You see, the devil is tempting you to do what is wrong. 
Again, Jesus draw the sword. Jesus said unto him, It is written again. It is written again. He fought the devil on the basis of the written word. He didn't fight the devil with a dream. He didn't, find it. he didn't fight the devil with a revelation. He didn't fight the devil with another kind of weapon that you don't have, that I don't have. He threw out the sword. It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and uh, showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship, me, and worship me. The devil wanted him to take the wrong action in trying to get something that God had promised and something that the whole of the Old Testament at laid down will eventually belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if you read Daniel, and you read other parts of the Old Testament, and other parts of the New Testament too, you will see, all this world eventually will be ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ. But then the devil came and said, let me give you before God is ready. God is delaying this thing. God is uh, delaying too much and he's still going to wait until this will happen and that will happen and that will happen before he, be he brings everything to you. I can give it to you now. But you have to take an action. You will have to fall down and worship me. Again, Jesus threw out the sword. And uh, in verse 10, Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written. You see that? The word of God is a sword of the Spirit. And when you throw that sword against the devil, you will be able to overcome and live the Christian life according to the standard laid down in the word of God. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Does the devil want you to use your ability, your talent, and your gift, and your possession in the wrong way, throw out the sword at him, and tell him it is written. Quote the word of God, and you'll be living the right life. Does he want you to take the promise of God, and twist it, and distort it, and interpret it the wrong way, and then bring out the pride of your life, and then do something that is wrong? Throw out your sword, and you tell the devil that you are going to follow the word of God. Or he still want you to take the wrong action, the wrong step. And he's coming with ideas, and he's saying, look at you. Hasn't God revealed himself to you before? Didn't he tell you this is what you will become? This is what you will do? This is what you will do? In your present condition, now don't you see this thing is getting late? Don't you see this thing is getting delayed? And you know, as long as you remain with these people that are always preaching the Bible, preaching the Bible, preaching the Bible, this thing is going to be dead for a long time. Therefore, why don't you take this step? Why don't you take this wrong action? And then all the world will become yours. Everything you ever dreamt about will become yours. Make sure you know the word of God. And throw the word of God at that devil with all your strength, with all the grace within you. And the sword of the Spirit will drive away the power and drive away the temptation of the enemy. Number three, the Holy Spirit, our supporter and sustainer. We cannot do without the Holy Spirit if we're going to live the Christian life. Look at this scene, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ, in Christ Jesus, has made me free from the law of sin and death. You want to be free from the law of sin and death? Get known, uh, know more about the Holy Spirit. You see, from the time you are being convicted of your sin, that conviction is of the Holy Spirit. 
When you began to pray, you did not know, a sinner did not know how to pray for salvation. It is the Holy Spirit that helped you to pray for salvation. And when you needed to quote the promise of God and hold on to the promise of God so that you will come out brightly converted on the other side, it was the Spirit of God that brought to your remembrance the promise of the Lord while you are kneeling or standing, while you are praying for salvation. And immediately you were born again. It was the Spirit of God that came to witness in your heart. Now you are a child of God. And along the way, when a temptation comes, it is the Spirit of God that brings the appropriate verse, the appropriate promise to your heart, so that you'll be able to throw the sword at the devil. And when there is discouragement, it is the word of the Spirit of God. It is he that will witness in your heart, go this way. Turn this way. You can pray now. You can look at the word of God now. It is the Holy Spirit. And it is by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus that has made us to be free from the law of sin and death. Let us look at it in verse 14. Verse many. As are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. As many as are led. You know, sometimes... Uh, you find that people say uh, a calamity came in their lives. Suddenly, they went to a particular place and a temptation took them by surprise and they fell without having a chance to even prepare themselves. They were not led of the Holy Spirit that morning. You will find sometimes that uh, a young man might be at home and this young man, while other people are going to do evangelism, this young man is staying at home. And the Spirit of God will say, Rise up now, take your Bible, and reach out and, be, and go and evangelize. And uh, this uh, uh, young man, maybe he did not uh, take note of what the Spirit of God is saying. He's saying, I cannot obey that inner voice today. And then he waited behind. Before you know what is happening, the old girlfriend just remembered that day that ah, this young man, he has gone with Jesus and gone with deeper life. Let me go and check him up today. Maybe I can bring him back to the world and bring him back to myself. Somebody knocked at the door. It was the old girlfriend. Before you know what is happening, this young man, this young Christian, had gone back completely into sin with the old girlfriend. He begins to cry. He said, why didn't I obey that inner voice in me? leading me to go out of the house and to go and evangelize. This uh, devilish uh, Jezebel will not have met me in the house if I listened and hearkened to the voice of the Spirit of God. You see, there are many people that just go into sin because they do not give the place of the Holy Spirit to Him. He is our guide. He is the one that is leading us. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. When temptation comes and confusion is likely to come, and you do not know what you are going to say, listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit within. It will lead you, it will lead you away from that temptation and make you to overcome. In verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. He helps you to pray. He helps you to understand that God is your Father. And in First John chapter 4, First John chapter 4, reading verse 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in Him, and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. In John chapter 6, verse 63. John 6, 63. It is a spirit that quickness. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You see, the Word of God was inspired by the Holy Ghost. The holy men of old wrote, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and they spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And since the Holy Ghost is the inspirer of the Word, 
that Holy Spirit will be quickening the word of God in your heart. He will be reminding you of the word of God, the appropriate word that will make you to be able to overcome in the evil day. In John chapter 14, John chapter 14 verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. He shall teach you all things. What does that mean? You see, sometimes we listen to the word of God here. And the word of God, although it is clear, although it is practical, although it brings in many examples and many illustrations, you get back home. And then, the situation you find yourself, all the word of God you listen to did not mention that example. Did not mention that practical situation where you meet yourself now. What are you going to do? It says the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. At that time, he will begin to take the word of God and apply it to that situation. And then he will bring all things to your remembrance. The word of God that has been stored in your heart, stored in your mind, stored in your brain, when temptation comes, when difficulty comes, alone, at home, when there is no preacher with you, alone, when there is uh, no minister of God with you, the Holy Spirit with, with you will bring to your remembrance the word of God, whatsoever I have said unto you. Let us look at Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59, reading from verse 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And if you are there, if you are born again, you have the Spirit of God with you. And when you are sanctified, you have more of the Spirit of God in you. And when you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, that will be a wonderful experience to become anointed, you become endued, you become en uh, closed, and you become enveloped and clothed with power from on high. Then that Spirit of God is given to you in a greater measure. And when the enemy shall come, you see some people who are baptized in the Holy Ghost, they do not know the fullness of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They think it's only when they pray. Uh, but the Bible says when the enemy shall come in like a flood, like a deluge, and it will just rush upon you, and it will want to sweep you up your feet, it will want to just take you by surprise, and just take you away from the gospel, and it will come with a push, it will come with a great flood, with a mighty flood, then the Spirit of God will lift up a standard against the enemy. Then you will be able to stand. You see, when you have the fullness of the Spirit of God in your life, it makes you to stand firm and stand and be able to obey the word of God. In Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel 36 verse 27, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. I will put my spirit within you. And when that spirit of God comes within you, it will make you to walk in my statutes. You know, some people, they say they are baptized in the Holy Ghost. And while the message of the word of God is going on, they will be shaking. They won't listen to the word of God. Then they will rise up. They will want to interpret the preacher. The preacher, thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. If you truly have the spirit of God, the Lord will make you to walk in his statutes. He will not, not make you to confuse the meeting or to bring commotion. Or to draw the attention of the people away from the word of God. Other people, they say, they are now baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they tell us that uh, their wife, uh, the, the Lord said that their wife, they are not going to go along with that wife now. As they have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God is now pointing another person to them. And they don't want to disobey the Spirit of God. 
and they say, woman, now you live my life, because this is not my fault. I didn't say that yesterday. I didn't say that last week. You know, I've just received the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is telling me, I cannot continue with you. God has given me a ministry, and I will not be able to fulfill that ministry if you are with me. The Holy Ghost has given me a second wife, and the first wife will have to go. When you truly have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will cause you to walk in His statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. You see, this is how we can be strengthened and empowered and enabled to live to the high standard of the Word of God outlined for the believer in the Bible. Here is the power for Christian living. Christ, our Savior and strength. The Word of God, our sword and standard. The Holy Spirit, our supporter and sustainer. Let us stand up now and talk to the Lord in prayer that God will help us to be able to live the standard to the standard of the Word of God. Rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer that He will help you. So that by the grace of God, you will live according to the Word of God. Are you born again? Then Christ will be your Savior and your strength. Are you reading the Word of God? Then the Word of God will be the sword and the standard. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to do His work in your life? Then it will be your sustainer and your supporter. Only through Him, only by Him, shall we be able to live the life He wants us to live. You cannot do it yourself. You cannot live the Christian life alone in your own strength. You need Christ. You need the Word. You need the Spirit. Are you born again? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? And over yourself and over your life completely, totally unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ he is our Savior and strength. The Word, that's our sword and standard. The Spirit, our supporter and sustainer. The standard is high, the standard is holy. Are you receiving it with all your heart? Joyfully? Or are you being led astray by somebody else's exhortation and revelation? Keep to the word. Stand on the word. And defeat the devil. Whenever I want you to use any of your gift, any of your ability, any of the parts of your body in the wrong way, you throw out the sword of the spirit against him. Whenever he wants to distort the promise of God and make you to be able to operate in the pride of man and do what is wrong, throw out the sword against him. Whenever I want you to move in the wrong way, manifest the wrong action, take the wrong step, you take your stand and come against that devil and stand in the word by the word of the Lord through the power, the enablement of the Spirit of God and through the inward indwelling Christ that supplies strength and grace all the time unto you. You need His power to live the Christian life. 